Hello and welcome to Hack Attack. My name is Jakob Hack. I'm your host and you're watching Hack Attack episode. And in this episode, we're having a look at the evolution of the iOS platform as a music production platform, basically. So we'll be looking at the interconnectivity between apps, how that was evolved. And I've also put in some other milestones like the first synth, first looper, things like that. And I had to dig through a lot of old blog posts and a lot of old archives and you know stuff that didn't really exist anymore. And I had to find it in other various methods. So maybe I got some of these dates wrong. I'm hoping I didn't, but if anyone notices anything out of place, comment down below. Also, if there are any highlights that you think that I've missed, that you think were important for the iOS music platform, then please comment about that down below too. Our journey starts back in 2007 when the first iPhone was released with OS 1. It was running a version of OS for Mac, but for the iOS platform instead. Now, this was a significant thing that happened. Steve Jobs was basically introducing this buttonless phone where you were interacting with your fingers on a screen. Now, at this point, there was no app store, nothing like that. So you only had apps made by Apple, but that quickly changed when WWDC happened. This was in June 2008 and Apple actually introduced the app store and it opened up for third party developers to actually make and sell apps for the iPhone. And another interesting thing that happened during this WWDC event was there was an app that was demoed on stage called Band by Moo Cow Music. And it is actually the first music app on the App Store made by a third party developer. <laughs> So moving on, we hit July 2008, we get the first version of Beatmaker, and it's the first proper beatmaking app for iPhone uh, slash iOS. Moving on from that, we hit September 2008, when we get the first iPhone synthesizer. Moving on from that, we get to December 2008, and we get Loopy. Loopy has been a significant app for iOS music making in general. It's been featured on The Tonight Show, I think two times, and it really opened up some eyes out there. Now there is something else important with Loopy, and that is the guy who made it, Michael Tyson. He made something that changed the game for iOS music completely. And we're getting to that. So in December 2008, we get Bebot, which is a touch instrument, and it's still on the App Store. Wow. And next we hit August 2009, Bleepbox. Now this one is interesting because it really got a lot of people to really see the iPhone as a production tool because this is a groove box and it's completely synthesis based. Drums and synthesizer in here is synthesis based. Moving on from that, we get the first digital audio workstation. This is in September 2009. And remember, at this point, apps can still not talk to each other. Each app is an island. There are no protocols for moving audio from one app into another. However, that was about to change because in January 2010, we get something called Audio Copy and Audio Paste SDK. This is a software development kit that allowed other third party developers to implement this code into their apps. And it meant that the user could then use this to copy audio the same way that you're copying text and pasting it into another music app. So suddenly we could get audio from one app into another. So moving on, we get 
Korg's first iPad instrument. It's iElectribe and it hits the App Store in April 2010. Pretty significant having this huge software and hardware developer entering the iOS music app scene. And this happened on the same day that Apple introduced the first generation iPad. So before this, there was only the iPhone and suddenly we had this huge screen with this first iPad. I say we uh, as if I was here when that happened and I, I wasn't. I was still a desktop producer. I was using desktop systems and hardware and I hadn't even begun doing serious mobile music making until about 2013 or something like that. Holding the internet in your hands. It's an incredible experience. So moving on to the next milestone, Gorillaz releases an album made on an iPad. It's called The Fall. And this was significant because the Gorillaz was a very popular group back then. And having them do something like this, or at least the co-founder of Gorillaz, Damon Alburn, work on this while on tour on an iPad, well, it really put the iPad on the map for music makers out there. Moving on from that, we hit March 2011, and now Apple gets serious about music production on iOS, releasing a version of GarageBand. So moving on from that, we hit September 2011, and Alchemy Mobile by uh, Camel Audio was released. I got this here because it quickly became one of the most popular synthesizers on the iOS platform. And when Apple purchased Camel Audio in 2015 and removed Alchemy from the App Store, it caused quite a lot of stir because a lot of people had a lot of money invested into this app. And so if you deleted the app after 2015, you could no longer download it. It was completely removed and later added to Logic I thought it was an interesting thing to add on this timeline. Next up, we have Animog hitting the App Store in October 2011. And this is significant because another huge synth hardware developer enters the music app platform. Moving on from that, we get to December 2011. Remember Loopy? The guy who made that, Michael Tyson. Now, Michael was developing something while he was traveling through Europe with his wife in a caravan and somewhere in between Denmark and the south of France, he had the first version of iOS audio pipeline functioning on his iPad. He basically set an update for Loopy HD aside and just worked on this. And he was actually talking to a group of developers about this. And one of the things that came up a lot was, was Apple going to be okay with this? You know, having apps talk to each other like this in real time. They didn't know. And so he met this guy called Sebastian Dittman, who you might know from Audiobus. Well, basically Sebastian had had some experience releasing apps and he had some contacts over at Apple. He talked to them and tried to, you know, get a feel for what they would say. They didn't say no and they didn't say yes, but this started something because later down the line, Apple introduced InterApp Audio and that's basically what iOS audio pipeline is. Right, moving on to December 2011, we get TC11, one of the first apps that really showed you what you could do with an iPad when it comes to visualizing an instrument. And also, I mean, this is a modular synthesizer and it sounds great. Very interesting app. I recommend anyone to try it out. Moving on from that, we hit Figure by Propellerhead. So now we have Propellerhead entering the App Store. This is in April 2012. It's one of the most downloaded apps on the App Store. It had this fluid, instant music making at the tip of your fingers, and it allowed for a lot of people to start making music who had never made music before because of the way how it works with scales and of the sequencer in there. One of the most brilliant apps ever, and it did pave the way for a lot of other apps coming after it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next up, we get Aria in July 2012. And this is significant because it got the music industry looking at the iPad as a professional production unit where you could actually do some proper multi-tracking. And not only that, through Aria and in-app purchases, you could get a hold of some pro plugins that you could normally only get uh, on desktop and laptop. Well, now you could get it in Aria and that was quite significant too. So moving on from that, we hit July 2012 and audio share. Now before audio share, trying to manage audio files on iOS was a bit of a mess. Now there were a lot of other apps that you could use, but audio share just did it right. But if you got audio share, then you were set because it could store and manage a lot of different files, even text files, and it could uh, compress files and archives, and it could even unzip files. and. Many don't know this, but AudioShare even has a built-in MIDI player. I mean, it's only got one instrument, but I still think it's very neat. Now, one thing I want to mention is iTunes. This is something that a lot of iOS music producers had to deal with because the only proper way of really getting files from your computer onto your iPad or from your iPad or iPhone to your computer was by using iTunes, connecting it up over a cable, a lightning cable, and then moving the files that way. And it left a lot to be desired because you didn't really have access to the filing system. Really annoying. And it's going to take years before Apple really addresses that. Now, moving on from AudioShare, we hit September 2012 and Impactor hits the App Store. This one is important because it's the first proper drum synthesizer app that uses the microphone input for drumming and it completely changed the microphone drumming game. There's never been an app like this, not until Drambo, because it's made by the same guy, Beep Street. He basically incorporated the Impactor engine into Drambo. Moving on from that, we hit October 2012, Borderlands Granular, another app that shows you how the iPad can be used as an instrument. It's a granular synthesizer, it's beautiful, and it's an excellent multi-touch instrument, perfectly suited for the iPad. Now, moving on from that, we hit another instrument. Also in 2012, it's Sampler, and it, I mean, there have never been a sampling app quite like Sampler. This can be used as a groove box, a sampling groove box. It's got seven different sampler modes. It's just a brilliant app. And it also shows you what the iPad can do. Perfect multi-touch instrument. instrument. Now, moving on from that, we hit the first version of Audiobus coming out. This is December 2012, and now we can suddenly stream live audio from one app into another. And not only that, we can also use other apps as effects. This is game-changing, inter-app audio in an app form. It's not completely integrated into iOS yet. And at this point in December 2012, the Audiobus SDK hasn't been released yet, so developers can't really use it for their apps, but it's about to happen. Now, Audiobus was out, and there is this one thing that is still a bit weird, and that is MIDI. You see, you kind of had to set up MIDI in the old-fashioned way by going into an app, if it had MIDI settings, of course, and then just assigning a channel. And for a lot of beginners, this was not a straightforward thing to do. Yeah, you know, this whole thing with an automated system that just sets up MIDI for you, well, we didn't really get that until Audiobus uh, was it two or three? I, I think it was three, or ugh, we're gonna get there at some point. And of course, I can't forget to mention that, see, these early years, this is the age of background audio. 
I mean, we're pre-AUV3 here, and so every app is an instance, and when you switch between them, well, if a developer did not implement background audio, then when switching from one app to another, the first app would go silent. If we move on, also in December, we get Cubasis. So now we have Steinberg also entering the scene. And this one was awesome because if you were using Cubase on desktop or laptop computers, you could export whatever you made inside Cubases to your desktop and laptop and continue working there, basically cross-platforming. So moving on from that, we hit the Audiobus software development kit being released for developers in March 2013. And now developers can incorporate the Audiobus code into their apps and have their apps communicate with other apps. Very, very significant. Now there was this other app that also came out in 2013, in March. It was Jack Audio Connection for iOS. Now this was a free app and it was based upon software already available for desktop and laptop computers. And it allowed you to connect not only audio, but also MIDI between apps. So here was this clash. We had Audiobus on one side and then we had Jack Audio Connection. However, Apple changed something in iOS and basically broke the way that Jack was communicating with other apps. And so Crudebyte, who made Jack Audio Connection for iOS, dropped the development for the app. And so it disappeared from the App Store. Now, moving on from that, we hit June 2013 and Michael has been working hard on the amazing audio engine. Now, the amazing audio engine is a framework for building iOS audio apps, kind of like AudioKit, which comes later. So it makes it easier for app developers to use this code, implement it uh, into their apps, uh, build their apps around it. And suddenly they also have a deep integration of Audiobus in their apps too, making it so that their apps can communicate with other apps through Audiobus. And so we hit the next date, which is September 2013, when iOS 7 comes out, Apple changes the architecture from 32-bit to 64-bit. And not only that, Core Audio gets support for inter-app audio. It is now official. Apple cares about the musician and music producers. And if you go back to this time, 2013, 2014, then if you search through old forums and old blog posts and stuff, you're gonna see a lot of people being kind of annoyed over the fact that apps are coming out and they don't have audio bus support or inter-app audio. These things are what people are wishing for the most, just being able to have apps communicate with each other. Now, there's this one thing with IAA. I mean, it was awesome being able to connect one app to another app. However, you could only run one instance of a particular app at a time. Moving on from that, we hit October 2013 and we get the audio copy app by Retronyms. Before this, there was only this software development kit that developers could implement so that you could copy an audio file in one app and paste it into another. Well, suddenly here we had an app where we could manage our audio files. And not only that, uh, they later added uh, in-app purchases with loop packs and sample packs. So that was an interesting thing that happened. Next up, we get to April 2014. We get Audiobus 2 and suddenly we can load multiple pipelines because, you know, the original Audiobus, you could have one and then you could load multiple apps in the input slot and then, you know, port them out to something or through something. Well, here you could have several pipelines or channels, as I call them. And that was quite significant. Moving on, we get loopy interrupt app audio multi-out, basically allowing for streaming multiple outputs of loopy into other apps, uh, basically Audiobus at this point. Yeah, so that's a cool thing that happened. Now, 
hitting December 2014, we get the first version of AudioKit actually hitting GitHub. And this is a nice little start here because this will later on become important. Moving on from that, we hit July 2015 and we get Audiobus Remote. And this allows you to use another iDevice to actually control stuff that is loaded inside Audiobus. This was a game changer back then and I was quite enthusiastic about it. And please don't go watch my old videos because I have the weirdest accent and I, I don't even know how to make myself sound like that anymore. We're gonna move on and we're hitting a very significant date in the evolution of the iOS music app. We're hitting September 2015 and with iOS 9 audio unit extension support. This is basically Audio Units version 3, shorted down to AUV3. And something that a lot of us doesn't know by this time is that multibus routing is already supported, but it takes years and years and years before someone actually implements it. Okay, so there's this one huge thing that AUV3 changed, and that was you were no longer limited to running one instance of the same app. AUV3 worked like plugins on a desktop or laptop computer. So now you could literally run several instances of the same app, which it just completely changed the game. And not only that, along with AUV3 support for iOS 9, Apple also introduces split screen multitasking for iPad, which is another interesting thing because now you can have apps side by side or as a sliding view. And I've been using that when I've been doing research, but I was hoping that we would see some interesting stuff like being able to have two different music apps side by side, like two versions of, of figures side by side, um, and that never happened, which is why I wanted to talk about it. So if we move on, we hit the iPad Pro, the first generation iPad Pro, 12.9 inch. Uh, it's as large as a 13 inch MacBook, and this is in November 2015 it's a significant point in the timeline because it got a lot of uh, pros in the music industry, you know, kind of eyeing the iOS uh, platform because of the large screen and everything. This is the iPad Pro. It's the most capable and powerful iPad we've ever created. Now, I'm not sure how I was able to miss putting this on the actual timeline, but the thing is that well, in December 2015, there was an update for Audiobus 2, which introduced support for Ableton Link. Now, this was a completely new syncing system made by Ableton. And it was an interesting time because people didn't really understand what it was. A lot of people thought you needed Ableton in order to run it, but it's actually just a syncing protocol that runs over Wi-Fi. Well, moving on from that, we get AUM Audio Mixer. It hits the App Store in February 2016, and it was significant because here we have this multi-channel audio mixer. It gives you full MIDI support with a routing matrix. It has AUV3 support and also support for inter-app audio. It hit the iOS music making community as a storm, and a lot of people got on AUM very, very quickly. Now, moving on, we hit another milestone here, September 2016, the iPhone 7 comes out and it doesn't have a headphone port. Hey, do you like this phone? Yes. Do you like this phone? Yes. Do you like this phone? Yes. yes. What about this one then? Oh no. Hey, the headphone port. Dongle. Can't find a headphone port. Dongle. Wait, it looks like this now. What? And I know a lot of people in the audience are gonna be like, oh, oh, why do you keep complaining? Well, if you are a music producer or a musician, not having this headphone port really does mess with your setup. And now you have to get a stupid dongle. You know, some of us just don't like that. And if you don't understand it, that's okay. Just don't hate us for not liking it. Okay, moving on from this before this gets infected, we get Audiobus 3 in April 2017. And this actually added a whole new MIDI system. It also added AUV3 support and it adds a mixer page and the ability to save sessions. 
So basically, we now had these two apps, AUM and Audiobus, kind of clashing. And a lot of people were wondering, which one should I get? And this is still a thing today. Which one should I get? Well, fret not. I'm working on a video that is thoroughly comparing the two. So stay tuned for that. Now, there was this one more thing that was quite significant back when Audiobus 3 came out, and that was that a completely new plugin format was introduced to the App Store. And these were MIDI filters, MIDI plugins, doing stuff just for MIDI. And the first one who did that was Johannes Dürr. I'm saying it in Swedish, but I think he's German. Either way, he had a very interesting suite of plugins, and it took some time before others started making them. And back when this came out, these weren't AUV3, and they were only available for RDBus 3. So we might be accustomed to having MIDI filters and MIDI plugins now, but back then, this was a completely new thing. Moving on, we hit September 2017, and we get iOS 11, and we get the Files app. Now, finally, we have a filing system. No more iTunes. I hated having to connect my iDevices to a desktop or laptop computer in order to move files between my iPad and also my computer. And not only that, it was annoying because some apps weren't supporting Audiobus or they weren't supporting AudioShare or, or Audio Copy Paste, which meant that you had to connect to a laptop or a desktop computer, use iTunes to actually get into the, the, the folders and then download your files. It was so annoying. I hated it, many hated it, but here with iOS 11, it, it basically puts a stop to that. Moving on from that, we hit June 2018, when the AudioKit Synth 1 comes out. It's been built completely with AudioKit. There's been a lot of developers contributing code to this. It's a free app. It's a fully featured synthesizer packed full with with features, with presets, with so many things. One of the most downloaded apps on the App Store to this date. It's been marketed by Apple. They've been displaying it on iPads in their stores around America. Big success. This launch basically put the AudioKit software development kit on the map for iOS music app makers out there. And after this, we start seeing a whole slew of apps coming out on the App Store, all of them being built with AudioKit. It really changed the game. Now, moving on from that, we hit June 2019. Significant date because Apple decides to deprecate uh, IAA, Interapp Audio, in favor of audio unit extensions. And not only that, not only do they kill a protocol, they also added support for user presets for AUV3. Yeah, that's right. There was no native user preset system in AUV3 on iOS. Developers had to build it in themselves. They had to make it themselves. Well, here in 2019 in June, Apple fixed it for them and it was no longer a problem. So moving on from that, we hit June 2019 and FabFilter goes AUV3. I am about to buy the uh, FabFilter Pro bundle. This is literally just gonna be me buying this package right now. Now, these plugins were only previously available in Aria, so you had to buy them as inner purchases there and you couldn't use them anywhere else. So it was really nice. Now, there's one problem though. No hosts out there supports AUV3 Multibus, meaning at this point, when FabFilter went AUV3 with their plugins, we could not use the side chaining abilities in these plugs. You see, they had already built in AUV3 multibus support into their apps. That's how the side chaining and everything were supposed to be used. And we had to wait until someone implemented it into their host. Moving on, we hit July 2019 and Elastic Drums introduces InterApp Audio Multi-Out. The reason to why I've got this here is because well, Apple has now went out and said, we're deprecating IAA, meaning they're gonna stop supporting it. And a lot of people got really, really upset with that because they're still relying on Interrap Audio for some apps. I am one of them. That's why I had Kyaras put in Interrap Audio support into Agonizer Synth. Well, even though Apple did that, the Elastic Drums developer still implemented IAA after that. So, I mean, I think that's, that's nice. IAA is not quite dead yet. 
Now, there is this one thing I forgot to add to the timeline, and that is in September 2019, with iOS 13, Apple actually adds hard drive support to iOS. So now we could finally use external storage devices with our iDevices. Well, we're moving on from that and we're hitting February 2020, I think. I think this is the time when AUM is the first AUV3 host that starts supporting the AUV3 multibus routing system. So now we can finally use the side chaining features inside FabFilter plugins, which is wonderful. And after this, a lot of app developers starts implementing uh, AUV3 multibus routing into their apps like Brambos and many, many, many others. Yeah, you know what? Let's, uh, let's kick this up a notch. I can't believe it, but it took five years. Five years it took before someone did this. Now, the next milestone is in April 2020 and Drambo hits the App Store. And to me and many others, Drambo, it's one of a kind app. It completely changes the Groovebox game. It's a Groovebox, it's a modular synthesizer built for, for easy connecting of modules. That's so broken English, but I'm Swedish and so sorry. It can function as an instrument. It can function as an effect unit. It's got an impactor engine built into it. The sequencer has electron-esque like features. It's just one of the best apps to hit the app store. It's, I don't know what to say. And I still haven't made my, my why you should get Drambo video yet. And I should really get to it. I'm sorry, I, I will at some point. Well, after 2020, there's not a lot of stuff that happened to the iOS music platform in the forms of new technologies or anything like that. The AUV3 multibus was pretty significant. So the next thing that happened was, well, 2020 was basically the year of YouTuber apps. We have August 2020 with Fundamental. It was Sonic Lab and Heinbach. And then in October 2020, we get House Mark 1, which is made with AudioKit Pro. This is from Henny the Business, who has a YouTube channel, and also Kennard Garrett. And then we got Agonizer Synth, <laughs> released by Kai Aras and myself. And then we get Gauss Field Looper, made by Brambos. And I I wrote Heinans. I'm, I'm so sorry, Heinbach. It's Heinbach. It's supposed to be Heinbach. And then we get Flip Sampler by Suture Sound Incorporated and also Andrew Huang. And that's where my timeline stops. Well, there is this one date in 2021 that I didn't put on this timeline, but I could just mention it here. And it's, of course, in May 2021 when the iPad Pro gets upgraded with an M1 chip, making the iPad Pro one of the most powerful tablets out there, if not the most powerful tablet. And I think that these new processors will change the music app game and music making on iPads significantly. So yeah, I hope you're still here. And if you are after that huge info dump, then please comment down below. What did you think? Are there any other uh, highlights that you would like to add to this timeline? I mean, I want you to have a look at this. Just look at this amount of development being made for, you know, protocols when it comes to interrupt audio, audio copy paste, AUV3. It's all happening between 2012 and 2017. 
yeah, a lot of stuff happening there and then it kind of slows down. Now I know I could have talked about other apps and other developers coming in, you know, changing the game for, for apps, but I'll leave that up to you. So go wild in the comment section. And before you leave, if you like this video, then why don't you hit the video with a thumbs up? If you didn't like this video, hit it with a thumbs down. And if you want to help support me in a financial way, then go check out my music, full list of links down below. And I've also got PayPal and Patreon. Now, as usual, I wish you a very productive week. Now go finger all of your stuff and have a lot of fun doing it. Woo. Oh, see, oh, you're so you're so pretty. My dog is right here and she's been trying to sleep through all of this. And I feel sorry for her. Yeah, I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna stop talking now, baby. And I'm gonna come and cuddle with you for a bit. <laughs>